would we still have language? Many linguists say no. Laura says yes. Language is an independent part of the brain, which would find some way to come out, even in the absence of sound. But in a world where language is expressed through speech, how would you study that question? Here's how. This is Ramey, 18 months old. Ramey is profoundly deaf, and so are his parents. From birth, he's been exposed to a language based not on speech, but on signs, produced not with the vocal tract, but with the hands. Both Ramey's parents communicate to him in sign language. Children like Ramey are a unique opportunity to test Laura's theory. If you want to understand whether language is involved in the production of babbling or speech is produced involved in the production of babbling, sign languages are the test case because they're not based on speech. <laughs> if Laura's theory is right, if babbling is tied to language and not to speech, then deaf kids like Ramey should babble. Of course, they wouldn't babble with their voices, they would babble with their hands. <laughs> Do they? And how would we know if they did? That's what Laura and graduate student Paula Marantet are trying to figure out. Each hour of videotape that she shoots takes Paula hundreds of hours to analyze. It's hard work to determine if Ramey is using his hands to babble. That's because kids use their hands in a lot of different ways. To point to things, to scratch themselves, to handle objects. <laughs> To express anger. We played with this before. And all kids do a lot of this kind of gesturing when they're excited. To filter these out, Paula and Laura study hearing children's hand movements as closely as they study deaf children. Given that Chloe Ray is producing this open closed gesture, we sort of store that knowledge. And when we see that in a deaf child, we think, okay, this is a form that occurs. We've observed this in hearing children. So it, it's probably a gesture rather than a sign or a babble. But even when Paula throws out all the gestures and points and scratches that she knows are not babbles, there's still a lot of hand activity left. This is Isabel. Watch her hands closely. This gesture has never been seen in hearing children, and it doesn't refer to anything. Now Paula can move to a new level of analysis. Is the hand shape and hand movement that the baby is using commonly seen in adult sign language? Watch as this adult makes the sign for angry and for curly. Notice the hand shape, an open hand with curved fingers, the same as Isabel's, and the movement, a kind of flapping at the wrist. Reminiscent of this movement, a sign that means don't want, as in, I don't want an apple. Now, how does what Isabel is doing with her hands compare with this? For Laura, all the hours of screening and studying come down to this question. Is what the deaf children do with their hands the same as what this hearing child does with his voice? What the child did is he extracted out a sound that he heard in his environment, a sound that's in world languages. He, it's organized in relation to another sound, so there's a consonant and a vowel. It's organized in a syllable, and this syllable is, re is repeated again and again and again. Now Laura turns to a tape of Vance, a nine-month-old deaf child. His sister and his mother are signing about what they did earlier that day. Trying to get into the conversation, but not yet able to sign, Vance puts his hand directly in their line of sight and makes this gesture. Here they are, all the same features of babbling that Laura has observed in hearing children. And of course, this time, the repeated syllable consists not of a consonant and vowel, but of a hand shape and hand movement. Vance is babbling. He's not actually signing the way his mother and sister are, 
but he's taking the first step. None of these forms are the identical form that a parent produces. In the same way in vocal babbling, the child, I mean, not many parents walk around the house going da, da, da. Nonetheless, children produce those forms. So um, the babbling is the child's active um, attempt to master the form of language, to listen to the environment, to look at the environment, to look for a particular structure, to extract out that st structure, and in little baby steps, play with these the forms of language in an attempt to build and master a target language. After analyzing hundreds of hours of tape, Laura has concluded that deaf babies babble just like hearing babies. And that's vital evidence for the theory that language does not need speech to express itself. It will find a way out by whatever means are available. But does this mean that sign language is just a substitute for speech? Something that the brain turns to when speech is not possible? Here's a way to find out. Simone is almost two years old. He's signing. And he's speaking. His mother is profoundly deaf and signs to him. His father is partially deaf and speaks to him in French. Simone, who has normal hearing, seems perfectly comfortable with this arrangement. For Simone, it's very natural. He never gets frustrated with it. He doesn't really make a distinction between the hearing and the deaf. People are very surprised that he can sign. He's like a model to the world. Simone is learning both to sign and to speak. But does he find speech more natural, easier to learn? Paula and Laura have been videotaping Simone since he was four months old. And here's what they've discovered. Simone is passing every major milestone in language learning, in both sign and speech, at exactly the same time. One of these milestones is putting two words together. Partir lolo, he says in French. The water's all gone. A few minutes later in the tape, he's putting two signs together. He signs monkey and then same, meaning the monkey in the room is the same as the one in the book. It suggests that the brain doesn't care if, if one is a signed language and one is a spoken language, that it can take input from sign or from speech equally well and do what it needs to to make a pro fully productive language. Years of painstaking work on babbling and language learning are bringing Laura closer and closer to the ultimate goal, understanding that highly inaccessible part of the brain, which is language itself. Communicating with your hands works fine as long as other people know the language. That's what Katie just said in sign language, and it points to the practical follow-up to this story. If Laura Petito is right, then using your hands is just as natural a way to communicate as using your voice. But evolution has created a world in which hearing is a given and speech is the norm, and that creates obstacles for deaf people. For example, think how much you'd miss watching television without sound. Actually, Thousands of deaf people see Frontiers and many other TV programs this way. These captions are broadcast along with the regular TV signal, but you normally don't see them unless you have a decoder. Captions help bridge the language gap, and they're a great example of the way technology should work. It doesn't get in the way if you don't need it, but if you do, it's right there.